Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you for joining me for us for another uh, episode of Meat and Potatoes with me, your host, Desi, as always. Now, today, we are out and about on location in North Adams, Massachusetts, at an artist studio. Now, this isn't just any artist studio. This studio belongs to a, a pretty impressive artist. Uh, this artist has works in the permitted collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the uh, National Gallery and the Smithsonian DC. Yeah, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and even right here at Mass Mocha in uh, North Adams and many others. Now, it's a pleasure to have you on the sto uh, show today, Mr. Stephen Hannock. Mr. Hannock, thank you so much for being on Meat and Potatoes. Well, Desi, you're welcome to the studio. Well, we thank don't, you. you know, we don't get many, you know, furry creatures crawling around here that are as big as you are. We get little ones on and four the, feet. The little you. ones, you probably make them scurry away. We you try to get them, them out of there, right? Well, I appreciate you uh, welcoming this little furry creature to your studio. Excellent. <laughs> now, Stephen, you are an artist. Now, but you don't just paint, right? Uh, you do all kinds of things with art. Um, you do some sculpture and some printmaking. I is that right? I well, you know, it's like, it's like pretty much anything else. When you get an idea that excites you, you bring that idea to life in whatever way makes the most sense. You get a great idea that might not be a great painting, but it'd make a great woodcut oh, or yeah. a great sculpture. Sure. So that's sort of how you go about doing that. Very cool. Uh, you even do some a little bit of interior design, right? Like so people want you to come and put some paintings in their in their restaurants or their sometimes, houses and stuff. Sometimes if friends have a place that your friends go to eat, they want something on the wall, that's always fun to do. Well, very cool. Now, what exactly is printmaking? Because that's something you do a lot too, right? Well, printmaking started way back Back in the Middle Ages where uh, artists were looking for a means to do more than one copy. Mm -hmm. So they would do drawings or paintings on a block of wood or a metal plate and then just run off copies of that as a way to get multiples. And that uh, happened around the same time the Gutenberg Bible was published so that you had ideas getting out to many, many people as opposed to just one sheet at a time. Oh, so you're literally making prints. Like absolutely. A, like a printing press. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, very cool. Now, my favorite type of painting is finger painting. Do you ever do any kind of finger painting? Sadly, I do too much finger painting. Oh, you do? Well, it's supposed to happen with the brush and the knife. Right, right. But I make such a mess yeah. that I wind up using my hands, too. Oh, that's good. So that's okay. Oh, yeah, it's okay. So finger painting is okay. Well, the thing that's cool about it yeah. is that no matter what you're doing while you're painting, nobody yells at you. Oh, yeah. 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 So you like, can get away with this. Like and nobody else at you. Finger painting on the walls at home in your bathroom. You that's, can do that too. Well, you can do that too. As your a parents matter, might get angry, huh? As, well, as a matter of fact, uh, one of my partners here had a son, and when he was less than two years old, we put one of his footprints. Huh? on one of my big paintings that's in New York now. Red, it's day, still there? It's still there. <laughs> and you're not gonna believe this, but he's grown up. Ariel is now probably 16 years old now. Wow. Yeah, he's his really- His foot's probably bigger than it was then. That's huh? what that's what his dad says. Oh, I don't know. I, I have kids you know, grow when you feed them. You know, they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Now, somebody told me that you sometimes will paint with two hands. Well, you know, it's kind of crossed wires, you know? Well, it's yeah. nothing. It's something that just sort of happened. I work with each hand the same way, and sometimes oh, cool. they both work at the same time. What's that and called? Do they call that something. Well, what they is call that? it ambidextrous. Oh, okay. Dexterous being hands and ambi mean both. Both, right? Yeah. And uh, it's really comes in handy in athletics. I've done a lot of athletics. Oh, in my I bet. Life and I switched over to art in the middle of college. Oh. And using both hands at the same time worked out in both arenas. I bet it does. Like, you were a hockey player, right? Right. So right. you could like deke left or you could deke right, you could go both ways. Well, I would have liked to, but I was a goalie. Oh, so. you were a goalie. <laughs> so I had to stay put. Which hand did you and put the stick in and which one did you put the glove yeah, in? Yeah, you sort of switch on oh, those two. keep them guessing. You I do. like that. <laughs> they don't know which way to go. Now, did you play like rugby too? No, no, no. no. Uh, uh, after uh, I retired from playing college hockey, I played ultimate frisbee, oh, which is a team great sport, sport yeah, with yeah. the frisbee. Oh, very cool. That was a lot of fun. I bet. 
Now, Steven, you are known for painting landscapes, right? Mm -hmm. What exactly is a landscape and what, what made you like uh, you know, start to paint them? What really inspired you? You know, that's a really good question, Desi, because I wasn't really out to paint any specific places. What I was trying to do was almost make set designs. Oh, wow. Because what I had in mind was stories about people, places, friends that I wanted to tell but in order to tell those, I wanted to set a mood. And the best way for me to set this mood was to create this place and an atmosphere in that place. Cool. And it look, came out looking like a landscape. It's got a horizon off in the yeah. distance. And, um, and now what I do is very frequently, I will write stories right through the landscape, but oh. you don't see it until you get up close. Oh, it cool. looks like the rhythm of the fields, but when you get up close, it's telling stories about things I might have done there or people I've met. And it's, it's all a matter of appreciating that the people and the adventures I have with these people mean more to me than the actual place. That's so cool. I was looking at a couple paintings that you have here in the studio. In a little bit, we'll go check some other ones out. But yeah, there's little writing when you look up really close. And there's little stories and stuff. It's so cool. Yeah, well, you know, that's funny because I was doing, I was writing in there and then gluing pictures that would augment what I was saying in the writing. Cool. And once again, nobody yelled at me. <laughs> You're an artist. So you should be able to do go. what you want, right? I and hopefully that, people I appreciate it. So. Well, mm -hmm. people certainly appreciate your art. That's true. It well, seems so, yeah. So far, so good. We're very lucky. Yeah, very good. Now, I've seen some, like, landscape painters. If I'm out on a hike or something, I'll see them standing, uh, sitting on a cliff, like, painting and looking out. Like, how do you get these views? And I know some of your places... Are, are they are they made up like in your mind? Well, don't tell anybody. Oh, okay. okay, this is just between you and me. Oh yes, but turn the cameras off for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Even though a place may exist in real life, I invent it anyway. Oh, I'm cool. always exaggerating rhythms in the place mm -hmm. or uh, perspectives mm -hmm. to um, highlight these moods that I'm trying to create to tell the stories with. And so even though a place exists in real life, I'm kind of bumping it in a yeah. little direction here and there. Well, that's great. That's like, uh, what do they call it? Artistic license, right? Well, that's what they say, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, some of your paintings are just ginormous. Now, why they're so big? I mean, it's not even as big as like the real landscapes, but uh, they're pretty big. What's your like biggest painting? And what's like your smallest painting? Well, my smallest painting, if we want to go reverse order, my smallest painting is like two inches by two inches. Whoa! That's and like super small. That's really small, and that happened by accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just making some marks, on th and it turned out to be a really cool painting, so I followed through and finished it. Very good. My biggest pieces are... I've done a couple of 30 foot pieces. Whoa. And a, and, but mostly 20 feet is as big as I get. Yeah. The reason why I was painting that large is my generation of painters grew up with movie screens. Mm -hmm. There wasn't much in the way of TV at mm -hmm. the time, so we would see Disney's animated movies when I was growing up. Right, yeah. Uh, Cinderella mm -hmm. or Snow White or Fantasia even on these huge projected screens. And I actually got into painting with phosphorescent paint. Oh, right, yeah. That glowed in the dark. Right. I was actually trying to create a still movie screen oh, and that yeah. was a really fun thing to do the only problem there is you have to be in the dark oh and yeah painting the, in the dark wears a little thin it could be while, tough on the know? eyes i imagine yeah, yeah. And everything now you know? yeah you said some of your paintings glow in the dark and like you use what they call what like luminescence in yeah they're paintings, phosphorescent right? paints yeah so cool yeah and, well hopefully uh, maybe you could show us one of those in a little bit if well we, walk we, the we don't have any of them here okay they're sort of in different different parts of the planet right, right now. Right, right. But sometime maybe you can come back and we'll paint in the dark. Oh, that would be Wouldn't cool. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. But Painting with glowing paint. I'm sure you could kind of show us how it's done a little bit, right? Well, we'll show. the thing that was fun is uh, a bunch of years ago, I was a visiting artist at Williams College mm -hmm. here in Western Massachusetts. Yep. And 
we had my students painting in the dark with glowing paint, and they had a great time. It, awesome. was, it was a lot of Some fun. Some people say, I glow in the dark. I bet you do, man. But I can never tell fur, because boy. I always sleep in the dark, so. Yeah. <laughs> and I sleep with a nightlight, too, so oh, it's hard you? to okay. tell. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, my daughter liked the nightlight, too, when she was little. Oh, I bet, yeah. It's, I'm, I'm still a little scared of the dark, so. Well, that's okay. Yeah, it that's is okay. A, it's, that's right, it's okay. <laughs> Face your fears. That's right. All right. Well, Stephen, I'll tell you what. Um, would you like to show us a couple little things here? You want to show you, us around? If you have the time. I know, I know I you're a busy to guy. See so. what you're working on. So. Okay, sure. All right, let's go check it out. Okay? Excellent. Sounds let's good. Go. All right, Steven. Well, uh, here you are. You've offered to show us around your studio a little bit, maybe uh, what you're working on right now. And uh, you've brought us to this wall over here. And you want to show us a couple things? Well, Desi, there's on? a lot going on. But I think yeah. the, the best place to start is always with one's teacher. Yeah. Because oh, teachers yeah. are really important. Very they're, important. They're the ones who get us going yeah. and, and highlight the things that we're interested in. And right here, we have Leonard Baskin who is an artist that was living uh, in Western Massachusetts, not far from where we are now. Okay. And he was on the faculty of Smith College. Okay, yeah. And he asked me to work with him privately. I swept up his studio oh, and yeah. got, he uh, helped me learn how to draw and stuff. And that takes a long time to do, but he, he I learned mostly by his example. And he would do these woodcuts and sculptures, and that's how I picked up. That's the stuff I wanted to do for, my own. for like printmaking, the wood right. carving, right? Is right, that right, yeah. right, exactly. And uh, as a matter of fact, let's go over and see one of those right now. Oh yeah, right? yeah, cool. Check it out. Let's show show us here. This right here is a woodcut that I've been working on uh, of the hometown of a musician friend of mine who mm -hmm. lived in, he, who grew up in Newcastle, England, way up north, and they made all these ships there. But now the shipbuilding industry all closed and they, all the workers lost their jobs and stuff, but the town has bounced back on wings of culture. There's a terrific performing arts center there, there's a lot of theater. Uh, high tech has come back into Newcastle. This series of woodcuts celebrates that, and it's becoming a book oh, cool. that is uh, going to be finished in two months. We've been working on it for three years. Wow. Yeah. And it's come down to the end right now. Two months, huh? I know. Wow. I know. Very cool. Absolutely. All right. So, so that's so you paint the wood carvings. Is did you do this first, a little sketch before you start carving them? Usually start with sketches, yeah. so that you can work things out because you see it in your head but it's right. kind of like vapor you know you right. can't really so you bring it to life by starting with drawings most of the time sometimes you go right to the canvas but with woodcuts I always like to start with a drawing and then you just cut out that which you don't want to be there. Oh, yeah. It sounds simple enough, and it actually is kind of simple. Oh, cool. Uh, now, speaking of sketches, looks like you got another uh, painting you're working on here, right? Right. And you have several sketches on the walls here with getting started, huh? That's very observant, Desi. This, that's really true. This is a drawing of a, a imaginary place that celebrates heroic women. Oh, cool. And uh, it starts with the character of Ophelia. Well, from uh, Hamlet, right? Shakespeare's from Hamlet. Hamlet yeah. right, exactly. And that figure was, I started with this one right here, mm -hmm. which is by John Everett Millay. And what I did was I invented the place that exists beyond the borders of the painting. And that's what gives us this. Cool. And then I'm gluing other images from more contemporary times here. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes a more sophisticated painting, oh, okay. which is what yeah, we let's have over check this here. Out. Yeah. Oh, so this is like a second sketch, even. Right. Yeah. This is the bigger sketch. Uh huh. And from here, what's going to happen is we are going to have, instead of the John Everett Millay painting, yeah. I'm substituting a paint a photograph by Gregory Crutzen. Okay. And Gregory Crutzen's a really good artist that lives around here, who built a suburban house 
at Mass Mocha and filled it with water. Whoa, uh, whoa, whoa. Like a whole house yeah. built at Mass built Mocha? Built the whole house. Is it still there? Or? Nope, he took it down after he wow. did it all for one photograph. Wow, that's commitment. Yeah, and he has his model lying in the flooded uh, living room there. Whoa. How cool is that? That's so cool. So I'm actually going to put that in my painting from the same landscape from the John Everett Millais things. What we're cool. doing is we're paying homage to these artists who've worked all throughout history. Oh, that's starting great. Starting from over 100 years ago. Yeah, wow. So you're paying homage to artists that came before you. Oh, yeah. that's all And the your time. inspirations, the kind of, always and in your. And now, you want to see the painting? That's oh, actually yeah, yeah, okay, definitely. So it's Learn started working, here. okay? Yeah, right. Now, the, okay. Yeah. Now this Whoa. is the painting that's just started. Yeah. You know, so it's the reason why it doesn't have as much detail as the drawings. I've just started here. Okay? It's so bright and shiny. It is. This I put different layers of resin on this. Okay. And then I polish it. And you want to see how I polish? Oh, it? I would love to see yeah. how you polish it. Okay. It's so cool. It, it's, it sounds crazy when you tell okay. people, but it's this really works. Oh wow! And what we do uh -huh. is we take some water so the paint okay. doesn't burn. Okay. We put that on there, yeah. and then. Whoa. That's how we do it. And the paint doesn't come off. No. No. What happens is all the globs of paint, which can be cool, but they actually interfere with my painting. Yeah. That removes those globs okay. so we're left with a much more resonant level of light. That's so what, that's how we're What doing makes that. it like glow really and shine with the phosphorescent paints, right? You know, it glows almost as much as those green eyes. Oh, are. stop, stop. <laughs> stop, you're too sweet. Hey, well, you know, I just. I like bright, shiny colors. This cold is cool. like this I is, see them. This is know? one of the reasons I wanted to be here to see <laughs> yeah, this. So. Very cool. Well, very awesome. Cool. Well, this is great, Stephen. Thanks so much. Let's. Uh, uh, let's uh, head back to the, the, the studio there, the table, and uh, we'll finish up our conversation. Sounds okay? great. Let's All go. Right. Sounds good. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. That was great. Seeing around the studio a little bit, checking it's, out what you do. Yeah, I it's appreciate it. It's been fun having you here, Desi. Oh, yeah. And you're not like our usual visitors. I'm not. Well, no. right. Except for the little furry creatures you got scurrying well, around. Well, yeah, occasion. but they're not as engaging as you oh, are. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. It's great. Now, before we go, we do a little section here called Three Questions. And this is Three Questions with Desi. So, are you ready? I'm going to put your trivia mind to the test. Okay. I hope I don't let you down All here. Right. I'll do my best. Now, you are Stephen Hannock. Correct. But I want to ask you a question about hammocks. Okay. Now, here's <laughs> hammocks, all right? You know what a hammock is, right? right like right. one of those little sling beds you put up between two trees, right? I've taken many naps in hammocks. Well, very good. Okay, here's your question. Where does the name hammock come from? Now, I'll give you a choice here. Now, first of all, um, some say that when the Spanish came over, to South America, and uh, the Caribbean d discovered North America, so they say, right? They saw um, the Native Americans using these things that they put between two trees, and they used the word, the Spanish word, hanaka, hamaca, which means net. That's your first option. Now the second, it was invented, well it wasn't invented, but when it became commercialized around the 1930s and they started selling these things, there was a guy named David Hammock who really developed it and started selling it. And uh, that's where the name comes from. What do you think? I'll give you two choices. I like the Spanish version The myself. Spanish version. Yeah, of, it's got more interesting history. It does, and, right? And uh, we have plenty of people who name things after their own right, right. selves. Well, you stuff. would be correct. The, the Spanish word hamaca means net, and that's what they call the hammock, and it's Excellent. stuck ever since. Very good. Excellent. Impressive. Oh, great. Now, <laughs> what part of a pig is a ham hock? Um, isn't the ham hock uh, the back hindquarters? It's kind of, it's a, it's a portion like the ankle almost of a pig. Oh, is it? Yeah, the lower, yeah, yeah. The hoof area. Who knew right. you knew so much about ham hocks? Well, I, you know, I've, I've missed that, but uh, um, I'll keep that in mind. Oh, should any good. wander yeah. You could share that information with your friends at the next That's dinner good to party. Know. Yes. That's good to know. All right. And last of all, there are a lot of Stevens out there. 
You are Stephen Hannock, and you spell yours with a PH, right? Correct. All right, I'm going to give you a test. I'm okay. going to name some Stevens here. Okay. And I want you to tell me whether they're V Stevens or PH Stevens. Wow, okay. Okay? okay. Channel your inner Steven to see um, if you can figure it out. Okay, ready? First, Stephen Jobs, V or PH? That would be V. V, correct. You got one right. All right. Steven Spielberg. That would be V as well. V, yeah. Have you worked with him before? I haven't, but he's getting one of our new books. Oh, He's ordered very cool. one of our new books. Very so. cool. What about uh, Stephen King? That would be PH. P you're three for three so far. That's good. What about um, Stephen Hawking? That would also be PH. I Why, you are good. My goodness. All right, here's a tough one Stephen Seagal. Ha! That would be V, I think. V, correct. You know you're Stevens. All right. What about Stephen Colbert? Stephen Colbert, that would also be, that would be PH. PH, this guy's good, man. All right, I got two more for you, ready? Stephen Tyler, Aerosmith. Stephen Tyler, that is, that would be V. V, you are on a roll. All right, last one, see if you can be perfect here. Stephen Carell. Stephen Carell, I believe that is PH. Oh, actually, Stephen is Carell a is a V. And yes. Wrong. Not bad, though. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of eight. Not bad. Wow. All right. Wow. Well, Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having us at your studio today. Desi, you're welcome anytime. And keep doing great work, all right? I'll, I'll try. We'll, we'll keep in touch and see I'll how try. you're doing, all right? Thanks so much, Stephen. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, see you guys thanks later. for joining us once again <laughs> on this episode of Meat and Potatoes. Bye-bye. Woohoo! <laughs>